All right. Let's, let's get going into the word today. Um, I need a couple volunteers. Uh, Jaden, Violet, Sebastiano, come here. You like the way we volunteer people? <laughs> I have developed uh, over the last several years a unique um, prophetic ability to tell someone's future by sniffing their shoe. I know, I didn't want that, but hey, it is what it is. Uh, Jaden, let me have your shoe. I don't think I need to. Okay, put it back, put it back. Oh, I'm, I don't know how to say this to you, Jaden, but you're going to die laughing. <laughs> I'm not in control of what comes out. Uh, Sebastiano, I'm sure it won't be like that. Let me have your shoe. Okay. He's a nice shoe. Hmm. Hmm. Please put it back on quickly. Wow, this is weird. This never happens. Like, um, you're going to die crying. What do you mean? You're going to cry and die. <laughs> no! <laughs> All right, uh, Violet, um, I'm sure it won't be like them. I'm glad you're so willing to give me your shoe after that. Um, but, well, this is weird. I'm getting, you're going to be running around with only one shoe on. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Good job. I know that's silly. It's Mother's Day. I want to do something silly. But also, I want to do something silly because sometimes the way we think about prophets in prophecy is silly. And prophets are what we're up to today in our journey through the story of Scripture. Sometimes the way we think about prophets as these mysterious people who talk about mysterious things and no one understands like, if that's your understanding of what a prophet is, then you are missing out on the role and the purpose of prophets in the people of God throughout history. Which is a shame, because we need to hear what the prophets of Scripture are saying. We need them speaking into our lives today as much as at any other time. Prophets spoke to God's people in in-between times. Times between something God had promised and, and getting it. We live, we live in an in-between time. A time in between Jesus' resurrection and his return. A time between when Jesus inaugurated new creation and started it and when it will be completed. We live in an in-between time. And Jesus' followers have been living in an in-between time for a really, really really long time. Imagine being the first disciples. Imagine seeing Jesus go through the agony of crucifixion, and then you have those feelings, and then you go to the elation of seeing Jesus resurrected, and then you go to the anticipation of Jesus' return once he ascends into heaven, and the apprehension about how are we supposed to live now while we wait for him to come back, and then, boom, the Holy Spirit comes. Jesus sends the Holy Spirit and all of a sudden, the church is born and it begins to grow. And every day, people are being added and added more and more people every day. And it's win after win after win. And you wouldn't blame them for thinking this is just the way it's going to go. This in-between time is going to be win after win after win until Jesus comes back. But very, very quickly, they started taking losses. Stephen was stoned to death. And just run through the list. Peter, crucified upside down. Paul, beheaded. Thomas, killed with soldiers, stabbing him with their spears. Andrew, crucified. Philip, tortured to death. Matthew, stabbed to death. James, clubbed and stoned to death. Pretty soon, Christians all over are being tortured and killed. And they're taking loss after loss after loss. And what are you supposed to do when God's promised future doesn't match up with your present reality? when your life is a mess and just keeps getting messier and messier, what you're supposed to do is listen to the voice of the prophets. They are God's messengers. 
When life is messy, listen to God's messengers. Life is messy today, isn't it? Christianity might be growing in some parts of the world, but not in America. America is not one of the places Christianity is growing. In fact, it feels like we're taking loss after loss. And it might feel as though God's people are suffering. And you, as someone who gave your heart to Christ, you might have started gangbusters ready to go. But maybe in your life, you've been taking loss after loss after loss. And you're in, stuck in this in-between time and you're not sure what to make of it. Listen to God's messengers. Pay attention to God's prophets. I want to I help us today learn to hear what it is they're saying. But let, let's rewind a little bit. Let's go back. We've been talking about the story of Scripture. Let's just kind of sit back and zoom back in. 5, 12, 5, 5, 12, 4, 1, 21, 1. Have you been falling asleep with that in your head? <laughs> My hope is that you're in the grocery store trying to calculate how much it's going to come up to, and you're like, 5, 12, 5, why? 5, 12, 12. Going through. But remember what this was. It was showing us how Scripture's organized, so you get a handle when you pick up your Bible to know the first five books are what we call books of the Pentateuch, or the five books, the, the law, how God showed who he was. And then you have the 12 books of history of Israel. And then the next five, five, 12, you have five books of poetry, five major and 12 minor prophets. They're not major and minor because they're more or less important. It's just the major ones are longer. The minor ones are just shorter books. They're all really important prophets. And that all happens inside of the 12 books of history but we get the individual writings of the prophets outside. And then you come to the New Testament, you have the four different gospels, each written about the life of Jesus. Three of them share a lot of information together, put in different formats, depending on who was preaching it and sharing it. And then you have the one book of history, the book of Acts. And then 21 letters that were sent and circulated around either one church or multiple churches. And, and then we get to the last one, something we'll, I'll call Apocalypse, um, very unique writing, very, very different. The book of Revelation, a lot of people get confused by it. We'll get, get there in a few weeks. That's our hands. And so far, we've learned from Genesis that we were created. We have value and purpose. We are not the result of some purposeless process. God gave us life and gave us value and purpose. And we learned that God made this earth a place where we, he could be with us and we could be with him. That's what Genesis creation stories is about. God's work so that he could be with us and we could be with him. The problem was we decided we want to have everything ordered around ourselves. We want to decide what's right and wrong for ourselves. And everybody started doing that and the world reverted to chaos. And you wouldn't have blamed God for saying, I'm done. These guys are knuckleheads. I'm through. But that's not what God did. Instead, God bound himself to us in a covenant. Imagine that. God's response to our faithlessness was to, be, to bind himself to us in a covenant. A covenant, we said, is a relationship that is a perfect blend of law and love, of obligation and affection. It is perfectly balanced together. And God, sometimes we talk about having a personal relationship with God. God offers us something so much more than that. It's a covenant relationship where we get to be bound together with him. And we find that in that covenant relationship, we find life. But we drift from that covenant relationship because we are unfaithful. We are stained and broken by sin. It's that part of us that resists God and wants to be in control for ourselves. And so we wander, and we learned from King David's life last week, what's the best thing to do when you wander? To repent quickly and completely. And we saw King David do that. And we saw God, last week, we saw God made a covenant specifically with David. And he told David, David's like, God, I want to build you a house. And God says, you want to build me a house? No, I'm going to build you a house, David. And he says, I'm going to make you a house, a kingdom that will last forever. And if I were David, I would expect once God makes me that promise, things are going to go, what? Up, up, up. All the way into forever. Here's what actually happened. We'll go through this really quickly, okay? Hang on. We're going to go through a few thousand years here, or several hundred years here, uh, in just a few gulps of air. So David was king around 1000 BC. His never-ending kingdom that God promised him, your kingdom will never end, it passed to his son Solomon. Solomon 
was good at first. He built the temple for God, but then he ended badly. The kingdom went, the throne went to his son, Rehoboam. <sighs> Rehoboam followed some bad advice, kept increasing the taxes. The people revolted. There was a civil war. The nation split into two. The northern part retained the name Israel. The southern part became Judah. We've got a map of that. Two separate kingdoms. The eternal kingdom is now broken and fractured into two. So David's reign ended around 970 BC. And within about 40 years or so, the kingdom is split. Within 200 years, in about 722 BC, the northern kingdom, Israel, is carried off into captivity and into exile by the Assyrians, and they fall. About 136 years after that, in 586 BC, the southern kingdom falls to the Babylonians, and they are carried off into exile. So in just about 400 years, just over 400 years, the never-ending kingdom has split in two, has gone through civil war, completely crumbled, fallen, and dragged off into exile to foreign nations. What would you and I be saying if we lived during those times? You just imagine. I don't know if it would sound much different than the way we talk right now. Did you hear what the king is doing now? Why is, why is it so hard to find a job? Why is food so expensive now? This country is not the way it used to be. Did you hear about what happened yesterday with those people over there? Tragedy after tragedy, loss after loss. Where is God? Where is God? It's the same question realistic people ask today. Even people of faith ask, where is God? In this in-between time, where is God? And this is why it's so important to read and dig in and try and understand Scripture because as we read what the prophets said, God's messengers, to people who were living in an in-between time, to people who kept watching losses pile up around them, we begin to learn who God is. And we develop an understanding of, if we understand what God has done in the past, it helps us understand what God might be doing in the present and gives us a realistic expectation for what God is going to do in the future. So God sent prophets. He sent some to the northern kingdom Israel. He sent some to the southern kingdom Judah. He sent some to nations that were enemies of Israel. Do you know why? Because from the very beginning, God's heart was not just for one group of people. His covenant with Abraham, the very beginning of this, was so that Abraham, I'm going to bless you so I can bless the world through you. That's what God's trying to do. So he sends these different prophets. And we think of prophets as, you know, they're fighting against uh, other fake gods and their fake prophets. We think of Elijah going up against the prophets of Baal. And the prophets of Baal are trying to make fire fall. And they're cutting themselves and doing all kinds of nonsense. And it doesn't work. And, and Elijah wins. We think, like, yeah, prophets, they fight against the fake gods. But do you know what the major obstacle that God's messengers, God's prophets was that they had to deal with? It was the unfaithfulness of God's people. The main part, the, the heart of their message was aimed at God's people who were being unfaithful to God, who were unfaithful to the God who had rescued them and given them life, unfaithful to the God who created them and bonded himself to them in response to their sinfulness and unfaithfulness. They weren't faithful to that God, our God, or to the covenant and his desire to bless the world through them. And so Israel continues to fail, and God sends these prophets because he wants them to be his people that he can bless the world through. And so their main message, their main message begins with one simple word, repent. A lot of people, you, you've seen people walking around with signs that say that, but most people don't know what it means. It's like, say you have a friend and you catch them being unfaithful to their spouse. It's like you running up to them saying, what are you doing? Stop. No, come with me. Let's go the other way. Don't do this. That's what they're doing. Turn around and go the other way. God's over here. You're going over there. Turn around. Come with me. Let's go back to God. He's the one who truly loves you. He's the one who can truly bless you. He's the one who gave you life. Look at what he's done. That's repent. That's what it means. And the prophet's main message was not secret mysteries. It was to state the obvious. 
Repent and turn back to God and be faithful to God and you'll be blessed. Keep going away from God and guess what will happen? You'll suffer the cursed consequences of a life without God. That's just the truth, plain and simple, that we need as unfaithful, broken people, all of us, to be constantly reminded of, especially in in-between times when it's easy to lose track of what am I doing? What's, what's going on? The losses are piling up. Ah, we need to be reminded. Repent and turn to God. Some of the things they said pointed toward a future. There are future elements in their prophecy, to be sure. The fulfillment of their prophecies, there was some of it that happened in their lifetime. A lot of it happened later, right? It happened later with Jesus, and some of it still has yet to happen. But don't get so hung up on the future aspects of prophecy that we miss the main message that we're supposed to hear as people living in an in-between time with losses piling up around us. The main message is repent and see what God will do. Let me show you an example from Isaiah. If you're following along on our app, you've got space there to take notes. You can open your Bible, Isaiah chapter 1. Isaiah is one of our major prophets, not because he's more important than the others, but because his book is longer. Okay, you got it. Verse 11 says this. Isaiah chapter 1, starting in verse 11. God's angry. He says, The multitude of your sacrifices, what are they to me? Says the Lord. I have more than enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fattened animals. I have no pleasure in the blood of bulls and lambs and goats. When you come to appear before me, who has asked this of you, this trampling of my courts in my temple? Stop bringing meaningless offerings. Your incense is detestable to me. New moons, Sabbaths, convocations. I cannot bear with your worthless assemblies, your new moon feasts and your appointed festivals. I hate with all my being. This is God talking about church. They have become a burden to me. I'm weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands in prayer, I hide my eyes from you. Even when you offer many prayers, I'm not listening. Your hands are full of blood. That's God saying to them, Get away from me with your gifts and your professions of love. That's what all that stuff is. Get away from me with all these professions of love when you're at the same time being unfaithful to me. You've just been living your own life, doing your own thing, not fulfilling what I've called you to do, be a conduit of my blessing to the world. You're being selfish. You're not keeping our covenant. But now you want to bring me these gifts and sing me these songs and make your sacrifices and offerings to me. I don't want to hear it. That's hard to hear from God, isn't it? The idea that when we open our mouths to sing, God's like, uh uh-uh. uh. I don't want to hear it. The idea that God would look at us gathered to worship Him and say, ugh, I feel like gagging, that God would say it. Why? But it makes sense if you realize if I'm unfaithful to God 99% of my week, and then I give 1% of my week to profess my love and faithfulness for Him. Wouldn't that make you sick if someone treated you that way? God doesn't want empty singing, begrudging giving, busy serving. That actually makes him angry. The same way a wife would get angry at her husband if he's sleeping around and brings her flowers and brings her candy and sings her a song that's pretty and sappy. And I don't care about that stuff. I want your faithfulness to me. I want you to be part of what I'm doing in this world. Let me try and drive this today. There's a lot of ways to apply this. I want to drive it to a fine point today. When might Jesus be angry at our worship? I want you to think of a time, or can you think of a time when Jesus was angry? Can you think of a moment when Jesus was angry? Think about it, think about it. Most of you right now, you're thinking about the time he walked into the temple courts and the people were there. They filled that outer court with tables where they were changing money and selling animals and things people could use for sacrifices. And Jesus went nuts and just started turning over the tables. He didn't go nuts. He was angry, righteously angry, and started flipping their tables over and kicking them out. Do you know why? That area, those outer courts, that that was the area for the nations to come in and, and worship God and be in God's presence. What made Jesus angry was that his people, God's people, whose 
one of their reasons for existing was to be God's conduit of blessing to the nations. They had taken God's temple and crowded out the nations. There was no room for them to do the thing God wanted to do through them most, bless the world. That made Jesus angry. One of the only times we see Jesus angry is that moment. And then I think about what the, temple, the, the New Testament says about us. Each one of us, according to the Bible, is a temple of the Holy Spirit. Once you become a follower of Jesus, the Bible tells us that he sends his spirit into us, and it's like now where this church building doesn't contain God. No building ever has. But the incredible thing about this new covenant Jesus established with us is that we get to be walking around living, breathing places where God's presence dwells. And if you and I have no room in our hearts and in our lives for sharing Jesus with other people, for being a conduit of God's blessing into other people's lives, for telling them the good news about Jesus, for doing what Jesus commissioned us to do. Think about right after Jesus established the new covenant, died on the cross, rose from the dead, he established this new relationship we can have with God through him in his blood. What did Jesus say next? Now I want you all to go to church five times a week. No. No. I want you to go. I want you to go making disciples, baptizing them into my family and teaching them how to follow me and obey everything I've said. That's what he called us to do. In this in-between time when there are so many distractions, some of us need to hear the message of the prophets, a message of conviction, because we've crowded out of our lives, maybe even out of our church together, Space. We don't bring people in. We don't go and we're not inviting people into God's presence. Instead, we've crowded out. There's no room for them to see God in us because we're so full of other things we've got to do and get done. And God isn't interested in our adulation without our faithfulness to his covenant. And one of the ways we demonstrate that faithfulness is by being a conduit of his blessing into the lives of others around us. Yeah, you're busy with work this week. Are you too busy? Is there no room in your life as a temple of the Holy Spirit to invite someone to Jesus this week? You don't got to drag them to Jesus. Some of us, we feel like, oh, this is going to be so hard. Like we got to grab somebody and say, come to Jesus with me. That's not what we're supposed to do. We go the same way Jesus went arms outstretched saying, come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. Live a life that demonstrates Jesus' love and justice and mercy and holiness. That's what he calls us to do. Some of us need to hear this call because Jesus said that if salt isn't salty, what is it? Useless. He said if light is covered up, what is it? Useless. And if God's people aren't radiating God's invitation into the world, then what are we? We need to hear the message of the prophets because it's easy for us and in between times to lose track of what it is we're supposed to be doing, to get caught up on all the losses that we fail to become part of the win. And all along, Jesus' heart's desire is for us to be part of the win. There's no wins because you and I aren't being who we're called to be. So when we're living in these in-between times, let's hear the voice of the, the message of the prophets. But there's a second part to the message. Let's go back to Isaiah, verse 16. Repent. See what God will do. He says, wash, make yourselves clean. Take your evil deeds out of my sight. Stop doing wrong. Repent. (laughs) Learn to do right. Seek justice. Defend the oppressed. Take up the cause of the fatherless. Plead the case of the widow. God's desire is for us to be a conduit of blessing. Come now, let us settle the matter, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. And then these last two verses are just the summary of the whole thing. Here's the message of the prophets that we need to hear today in this in-between time. If you're willing and obedient, you'll eat the good things of God, of the land. But if you resist and rebel, keep living your own life for your own self, you'll be devoured by the sword. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Some of us need to hear this, come see what God will do. Some of us need to hear the conviction, the warning part today. And that, honestly, for me, changes day by day, maybe within each day. There are moments of a day when I need God's spirit to convict. 
and remind me, hey, dude, are you mine? And other times when I need God to say, hey, you're mine. Some of you this morning need to hear the, you're mine part of this. Because you have failed, and you know it. And you've mourned the failure, and you feel shame, and you feel guilt. But that's all you feel. And all you feel is loss after loss, failure after failure. You're not being who you're supposed to be. You're a Christian now. Everything's supposed to go perfect. And you might be feeling shame and confusion and guilt and frustration. And your heart may be desperate to settle the matter and be done with your guilt. I talk to people sometimes who are new Christians and they're like, I don't understand. Like, why am I struggling so much with sin? I'm like, no, (laughs) you're struggling with sin because you're a Christian. If you're not following Jesus, why would you bother struggling against sin? Why would you bother struggling against that part of you that doesn't want to yield to God? You're not going to do that if you're not a follower of Jesus. But once you begin following Jesus, guess what? Struggle and losses. But in the midst of those losses, maybe you this morning need to hear Jesus saying, you're mine. I know you've lost. I know you failed. I hear your repentance. I forgive I give you strength. I wash you clean because you couldn't wash yourself clean. And you don't have to. Jesus died to wash us clean. Isaiah spoke these words hundreds of years before Jesus came. Hundreds and hundreds of years before Jesus came. But they revealed God's desire to settle the matter. But God also recognized that settling the matter was not something we'd be able to do. It was going to take God himself stepping in, being one of us, being fully God and fully man, taking our sin on himself, dying so that you and I can be washed clean regardless of what we've done or regardless of what loss you've had. There is no loss that you and I can face that is more powerful than the victory Jesus has already won. There is no evil, no sin, no failure, no mistake you can make that is more powerful than the forgiving grace God gives us through Jesus. So you might sit here saying, no way. Or you might have a friend. Maybe this isn't you, but you need to be thinking about that friend who's like, there's no way I could ever go to church. Lightning and whatever. I'll drop dead on the platform. And you need to tell them, there is is nothing you've done that's more powerful than Jesus' grace to forgive and make you new. Because God's desire is to be with us so we can be with him and to bond us to himself. Jesus demonstrated that on the cross. He is more powerful. Worship team, would you come back? So when life is messy and you feel like losses are piling up around you, pay attention to God's messengers calling you to turn around. Maybe you're lost wandering around. Turn around and come back to God and be faithful to him. And see what God will do in you. See how he will transform you. Look forward to it. Not just what God's going to do in you, but what God's going to do through you. Because God's going to now take you and make you a conduit of his blessing into this world. And all the joy of being able to do that. And it can happen in small ways. I just made a connection with one of my neighbors this week because the guy's phone service got cut off. And he, I just happened to be walking by, and he's like, hey, can I ask a favor? Now I've got a connection with him. He didn't become a Christian yet, but now I can, I'm not going to name him, but now I can talk to him. And we got a relationship started. Because why? Because I stopped, I listened, heard his need, did everything I could to help meet his need. I'm not asking you to go preach on the corner. I'm asking you to go love somebody with the love of Christ. Tell them about Jesus. That's all. Share the invitation. Invite them to come to church. Invite them out to lunch, to dinner, whatever. That's all. Tell them about Jesus and what he's done.